This video represents the very end of our unit on combinatorics in our lecture series Math 3120. Now, just to be clear, that does not mean this is the last video in our lecture series about combinatorics. In fact, this very last topic we're going to talk about, we're going to spend, uh, well, time in this video, of course, but we'll also spend some time in lecture 18 talking about it as well. Um, and that's because the topic itself can be very difficult for people as they first learn about it. And this is the topic of a combinatorial proof. I mean, after all, this is the second video in lecture 17. So by our tradition, uh, this should be about something logical. And as such, we're going to connect it to the topics of combinatorics we've been studying. And so what is a combinatorial proof? Well, it turns out that the proof technique is fairly simple to explain. Imagine that you have a set, a set A. And typically in combinatorics, what we want to do is we like to compute the size of a set. So we're trying to compute the cardinality of some set A. And let's say that after... Uh, some calculations, we argue that the that the set the cardinality of, of set A is equal to some function f of n, uh, where n is some parameter, and A itself is a set that will depend on n. Its size is dependent upon some variable in play here. So let's say that we show that uh, the cardinality of A is equal to f of n, but let's say we also can show that the cardinality of A is equal to g of n. Well, as we have two different formulas that then count the same set, we would have to then conclude that the two formulas are equal to each other. And this is at the heart of what a combinatorial proof is. We count the same set in two different ways, and then we can conclude that the two different formulas we came up that counted the same set have to be equal to each other. Simple, right? Well, why am I spending so much time on such a simple proof technique? Well, it turns out combinatorial proofs are easier said than done. Um, it turns out that in order to get good at combinatorial proofs, because the concept is simple, um, it's coming up with the right, with the right set to count that is difficult and honestly experience and gut feelings are what we want to develop right now. So let me begin with an example here, a very classic example. Um, let n be a positive number, although honestly this statement is true if you take n to be a zero as well, but we'll just focus on, on just positive numbers here. It really doesn't change the proof that much. And let's prove the identity 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 up to plus n is equal to n times n plus 1 over 2. Now, this right here is a classic. I'm talking about classic formula. And typically, this shows up, students see this for the first time inside of Calculus 1, which for um, SUU students, this coincides with Math 1210. And this is typically introduced um, as students are preparing to learn about or are already learning about Riemann sums, an object we would study before we introduce the definite integral as a, re a limit of a Riemann sum is where we get the integrals at all. Now, depending upon your uh, Calculus 1 class, you may or may not have seen a proof to this formula. Um, Again, it, it depends. It depends on the curriculum and the university or, or the school, what have you. But oftentimes when this formula is presented, whether it's in calculus or whether it's presented in another setting, it's proven using a, te a technique known as mathematical induction. And we will actually start learning about induction in our very next unit of this lecture series about integers. Induction is a very, very important uh, mathematical tool. And so mathematical induction deserves our attention. Mathematical induction is very, very useful at proving formulas like this. It's really good at it. It's super nice, super clean. But one problem about induction is it doesn't really explain why the formula holds. It just proves that it's true, which um, is something we'll, we'll talk some more about in the future, right? We'll, we'll talk about what's the difference between a constructive proof and a non-constructive proof. Uh, a proof can prove that something exists, but we have no idea what it is. Um, or a, a, conversely, you can have a proof that proves that something exists because it provides it to you in front of you. Um, induction is kind of like that non-constructive proof. It can prove that a statement is true, but it's true, who knows why? I mean, we know it's true, but it doesn't give us any idea where the formula came from. Like, how did you discover it? Conversely, a combinatorial proof actually provides uh, a why. It, it gives us some intuition of where the formula comes from. And so the reason I wanted to start with this proof right here is there's a classic myth that 10-year-old Gauss, Gauss is you know known commonly as the prince of mathematics, Frederick, uh, Carl Frederick Gauss here, uh, 
it supposedly as a 10 year old proved this formula and basically the proof that gauss is attributed to have given is essentially the proof that we are going to provide right now although we will provide a more modern flair to it using the notion of a ferris diagram but it, it's essentially equivalent to it and again in addition to proving the formula we also know where the formula came with because as the legend goes gauss was supposedly in his grade school math class given the task of adding one plus two plus three plus four plus five all the way up to 100 i believe was the number you're supposed to do you're supposed to add together the first 100 integers and so while most of the grade school students then were like one plus two is three plus three is six plus four is ten plus five is fifteen going through that's easy when you have single digits but eventually you start getting double digits triple digits additions you're likely going to make some mistakes along the way there's a lot of places where human error can happen um, but Gauss actually took a combinatorial proof approach, which he that that is he he decided to count this number in a different way, which was equivalent to what he had to do. It ended, it ended up being this formula right here, um, n times n plus one over two, and therefore he could very quickly count the number, and also is the only student who didn't do it erroneously. So let's see how it's true. So to prove this formula, I first want to introduce the notion of a Ferris diagram. Now, a Ferris diagram, you can think of it as a matrix array. It's a two-dimensional array consisting of dots and omissions. Uh, so if you want to think of it in terms of a matrix, you could think of like a zero, one matrix where a one represents, sorry, a dot represents a one and an omission represents a zero, something like that. Uh, but the rule is that the dots are always to the left of the blanks. So if you are, if you think of a zero, one matrix, the ones always appear to the left of the zeros inside of it. And that makes this Ferris diagram. And typically it's not required, but typically if they have different sizes, you're going to put larger sizes downward like so. So the following diagram, the following Ferris diagram you see right here, this is the type of object we're interested in right now. So you have one row, two rows, three rows, four rows, five rows. So if you could count the size of a Ferris diagram with five rows, that would then be the thing you're looking for. Now I'm going to slightly change my Ferris diagram here. I'm not going to look at this diagram, but keep this in mind because we're going to find it again in a moment. What I'm going to do Instead, as I'm going to consider the Ferris diagram, which is an n plus 1, n plus 1 square. That is, each row has n plus 1 many dots, and each column likewise has n plus 1 many dots in it as well. And what I want to do is I want to count the area of this Ferris diagram. Well, with the first attempt, this is a square with n plus 1 rows and n plus 1 columns. So the standard area formula comes into play here that a square's area is just going to be um, the side length squared. So the number of dots is going to be n plus 1 squared, n plus 1 times n plus 1. So that's, the that's our first account of how many dots are in this square. Now I'm going to take the same square, I'm going to count it slightly differently. Uh, notice this time, what if I just look at the diagonal elements of my square? How many are those going to be? Well, there's one exactly one diagonal element for every row of the square. There's n plus 1 rows. So I'm going to get n plus 1 many dots along the diagonal. So just consider the diagonal for a moment. Now consider the elements which are above the diagonal. You're going to look at this object right here. Now this is no coincidence. This set we have right here above the diagonal is exactly the sum of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 all the way up to plus n. That's why we had a square of n plus 1. So when we remove them, we actually get the thing we're counting before. And likewise, look at this Ferris diagram, this sub-diagram, I should say. This is the thing we were interested in counting, okay? Let's call this number s for the moment. Uh, that is, s is the number of dots in the triangular figuration. This, these are sometimes called triangle numbers, triangular numbers, because they count the number of dots in one of these Ferris triangles. So if you then re, uh, redistribute the things here, we have n plus 1 mini diagonal entries. So let's mark that there. We have n, uh, n plus 1 mini diagonals. Um, we have one of our triangle diagrams right here. There's s many of those. We don't know what that is yet, but there's s many of them. And then over here, you have an identical triangle. Uh, sure, it's been reflected, but still there's s of those. So when you put these together, you're going to have... 2s plus n plus 1 many dots in this n plus 1 square. But like we saw before, there's n plus 1 squared many dots in this as well. This is where the combinatorial proof came into play here. I counted the square once using just 
n plus one times n plus one, but then I counted the square with a different a different uh, scheme, and I got a different formula, 2s plus n plus 1. Notice s is the number I'm interested in. This equation is valid because the counted the same set twice. So I can solve this equation for, uh, for s right here. To do that, I'm actually going to um, foil out the right-hand side. You're going to get an n squared plus 2n plus 1. So then we can subtract the n and the minus 1 from both sides, minus n minus 1. So we're then going to get something like this right here. You're going to get 2s is equal to um, n squared plus n, which of course you can factor the n squared plus n as n times n plus 1, divide by 2, and you end up with s equals n times n plus 1 over 2. That was the formula we were trying to prove right there. And so this is our first example of a common toil proof. We counted the number of dots in this n plus 1 square in two different ways that gave us then a formula, this formula right here, as, in, as the number I actually cared about was embedded inside of the formula, we were able to manipulate that equation to get the formula that we were looking for. It's a really, really nice method. It's very clear to understand. But of course, how did I know I should be counting n plus 1 times n plus 1 size squares? That's intuition that is a little bit difficult to just um, tell to you. One, as you get better and better with combinatorics, you start to get better intuition, a better gut feeling on the things you like to count. But Ferris diagrams are a good place to go to try to count many of these combinatorial formulas. Let's provide another example, um, a slightly harder formula, one that's far less intuitive. Um, this time, let n be a positive integer. Then, if we take 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9, all the way up to 2n plus 1, 2n minus 1. So this is this on the left-hand side is the sum of consecutive odd integers. In the previous one, we were just adding consecutive integers, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. Now we're only adding together um, consecutive odd integers, 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7, etc. Um, I claim that is equal to n squared. That is, if you take the sum of consecutive odd integers, this always gives you a perfect square, and you'll get the next perfect square by adding the next odd integer. It's fantastic. It's it's not very intuitive at all that that would be the case, but it, it, is, it is the case. It's a pretty cool thing. Now, when I look at this formula right here, if I was trying to prove this using combinatorial proof, um, the previous example might have been a mis little mysterious how we did it, but this one has a, has a super, super obvious blues clues that we need to be looking for that tells us what we're going to count. When I look at the right-hand side, I see n squared. And much like because I'm thinking of the last proof, squares count the area of a square. That's why we call it square. We don't typically say n to the second power. We say n squared because of its relationship to the area of a square. So when I look at the right-hand side, I'm thinking I should be counting dots of a square so that you want to grab the low-hanging fruit. Oftentimes, the formula has a low-hanging fruit, and that's what's going to motivate the combinatorial proof. So in this situation, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to prove the formula using combinatorial proof, and I'm going to do that by counting the dots in the n by n Ferris diagram, which you can see illustrated right here. Now, like we saw in the previous proof, it has n rows and n columns, so... The, the number of dots in that square is going to be n squared, okay? That gives us the right-hand side. We often start with the low-hanging fruit in that regard. So what I have to now do in order to count the, the, the left-hand side, that is, in order to prove the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, I have to consider this square again, but then in such a way that I can produce these odd integers. And this takes a little bit of guessing and checking as one tries to write the proof, but notice the following idea here. I have one dot right here. I have three dots right here. I have five dots right here. I have seven dots right here, and then nine dots, and then 11 dots, like so. So if I look at these L-shaped configurations, you're always getting these odd numbers, and that's the relationship that we're gonna be looking for in the second attempt. I've now color-coded it to make it a little bit easier to see here. On the other hand, let's partition the cells in the uh, in the cell based upon their address. So we're gonna go back to linear algebra here. Notice that this is this right here is the one, one position, one, two position, one, three position, one, four. Uh, so the first index is the row that you live in. The second index is the column. This would be the two, one position, the two, two position, two, three, two, four, two, five, 
Um, this would here be the 4-1 position. Just, just so you're aware that each of these dots, it is a matrix after all, each of these dots has an address. I'm going to partition the cells, I'm going to partition the dots in this matrix based upon their address, but we're going to follow the rule that you belong to the group where you have the larger of the indices, right? So the one, one position is all by itself because the max of your indices one and one is itself one. And that's the only position where the max of the two indices will be one. On the other hand, uh, if you take the positions one, two, 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 and two, one, the largest coordinate in those addresses is two. And so they're all gonna put together in the two group. So you get the one group, which the one group was this one right here. Um, you then get the two group, which is this one right here. The next cell in our partition would be the three group. We're going to grab all of those addresses for which the maximum coordinate is three. That would include one, three, two, three, 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 two, and three, one, which gives you these ones right here. Then the next group would be the four group. You're going to get four, one, four, two, four, three, four, four. You'll get one, four, two, four, three, four, and then four, four again. And let's just do one more example for completeness here. If we look at the five group, you're going to get five, one, five, two, five, three, five, four, five, five. You'd also get one, five, two, five, three, five, four, five, and five, five. So each of these groups, the, if you think of the kth group, I claim that the kth group is going to contain 2k minus 1 many elements. And why is that? Because of those elements, you're going to end up with 1k, 2k, uh, whoops, 3k, all the way up to kk. And that coincides with considering these right here, this column. But you're also going to end up with k1, k2, k3, all the way up to kk again. Okay, that get, grabs the things in the row, all right? So notice how many things are in this list. Um, the first, This first consideration, there's k objects here because the first coordinate is allowed to range from 1 to k. With this second list, you again get k objects because the second coordinate is now allowed to range from 1 to k. But you also should notice that you counted the element kk twice. Uh, so by the inclusion-exclusion principle, there's k things in the first row, there's k things in the second row, but there is an overlap of one, the intersection's one. So each of these L-shaped objects is going to have 2k minus one many elements in it. And that's that itself is just the arbitrary odd number. So when k is one, you get one. When k is two, you get three. When k is uh, three, you get five. When k is four, you get seven, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, up until 2k, 2n minus one. Okay, so what this now shows us is that we can count the objects um, as of the square by n squared. We can also count the objects by taking the sum of things of the form 2k minus 1 as k ranges from 1 up to n, which the left-hand side is then the, is the sum of all of the odd integers. And so by the method of combinatorial proof, these things are equal to each other and thus proves the formula. We're going to do some more examples of combinatorial proof in the next lecture, lecture 18. So if you want some more practice, look for those videos uh, as well.